I was talking with Ron on the phone this afternoon, and he said he wanted to convey two things to the people here. Uh, one, he said that we all have to recognize and honor the enormous courage that it takes for soldiers and veterans to speak up uh, against their own nation, against the policies and actions of their own nation. That takes enormous courage, and want, Ron wanted to send his own personal thanks to all of them who are speaking here. The second thing that he said is to remember that what we're doing here is not just saving lives. He said, we're also saving the soul of our country. This is Ron's statement. As a former United States Marine Corps sergeant who was shot and paralyzed from my mid-chest down during my second tour of duty in Vietnam on January 20th, 1968, I am sending my complete support to all Iraq and Afghan veterans who with great courage and love of country have decided to participate in the 2008 Winter Soldier hearings in our nation's capital this week. What you do in these next few days will be historic and it will move the hearts of millions throughout our country and around the world. Know that I and countless other Vietnam veterans respect and admire you greatly for your bravery. We stand with you and will do whatever we can to support you in your effort. Never forget how important you are and that you are making history this week. You are saving lives. You are making your country a better place. Martin Luther King once said, a time comes when silence is betrayal. King went on to say that the truth of these words are beyond doubt, but the mission they call us to is a most difficult one. Even when pressed by the demands of inner truth, men do not easily assume the path of opposing their government's policy, especially in time of war. Nor does the human spirit move without great difficulty against all the apathy of conformist thought. He went on to say that, and some of us who have already begun to break the silence of the night have found that the calling to speak is often a vocation of agony. But we must speak. We must speak with all the humility that is appropriate to our limited vision, but we must speak. Over the past five years, I have watched in horror the mere image of another Vietnam unfolding in Iraq. So many similarities, so many things said that remind me of that war 30 years ago, which left me paralyzed and confined to a wheelchair for life. Refusing to learn from the lessons of Vietnam, our government continues to pursue a policy of deception, distortion, manipulation, and denial doing everything it can to hide from the American people their true intentions and agenda in Iraq. As we approach the fifth anniversary of this tragic and senseless war, I cannot help but think of the young men and women who have been wounded, nearly 30,000 flooding Walter Reed, Bethesda, Brook Army Medical Center, and veterans hospitals all across the country. Paraplegics, amputees, burn victims, the blinded and maimed, shocked and stunned, brain damaged and psychologically stressed, a whole new generation of severely maimed who were not even born when I came home wounded to the Bronx Veterans Hospital in New York in 1968. Post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, which afflicted so many of us after Vietnam, is just now beginning to appear among soldiers recently returned from the current war. For some, the agony and suffering, the sleepless nights, anxiety attacks, and awful bouts of insomnia, alienation, anger, and rage will last for decades, if not their whole lives. They will be trapped in a permanent nightmare of that war, of killing another man, a child, watching a friend die, fighting against an enemy that can never be seen while at any moment someone, a child, a woman, an old man, anyone might kill you. These traumas return home with us and we carry them, sometimes hidden for agonizing decades. They deeply impact our daily lives and the lives closest to us. To kill another human being 
to take another life out of this world with one pull of a trigger is something that never leaves you. It is as if a part of you dies with them. If you choose to keep on living, there may be a healing and even hope and happiness again, but that scar and memory and sorrow will be there with you forever. Why did the recruiters never mention these things? This was never in the slick pamphlets they gave us. Some of these veterans are showing up at homeless shelters around our country, while others have begun to courageously speak out against the senselessness and insanity of this war and the leaders who sent them there. During the 2004 Democratic Convention, returning soldiers formed a group called Iraq Veterans Against the War, just as we marched in Miami in August of 1972 as Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Still others have refused deployment to Iraq, gone to Canada, and begun resisting this immoral and illegal war. Like many Americans, I have seen them on TV or at the local veterans' hospitals, but for the most part, they remain hidden, like the flag-draped caskets of our dead returned to Dover Air Force Base in the darkness of night as this administration continues to pursue a policy of censorship tightly controlling the images coming out of that war and rarely ever allowing the human cost of their policy to be seen. Many of us promised ourselves long ago that we would never allow what happened to us in Vietnam to ever happen again. We had an obligation, a responsibility as citizens, as Americans, as human beings to raise our voices in protest. We could never forget the hospitals, the intensive care wards, the wounded all around us fighting for their lives, those long and painful years after we came home, those lonely nights. There were lives to save on both sides, young men and women who would be disfigured and maimed, mothers and fathers who would lose their sons and daughters, wives and loved ones who would suffer for decades to come if we did not do everything we could to stop the forward momentum of this madness. Mario Savio once said that there's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part and you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. It is time to stop the war machine. It is time for bold and daring action on the part of us all. Precious lives are at stake, both American and Iraqi. Thank you.